Hello and welcome to our next mathematics lesson. Today we're going to be learning about the Pythagorean theorem. Right? So I'm not just going to declare it to you, I'm going to prove this theorem to you. Uh, practically one only needs a single proof to know that a mathematical fact is absolutely true, but it's good to have multiple methods uh, to approach a problem because you can use those methods for other uh, similar types of problems. Um, so I'm going to show you three, three distinct proofs of this theorem. Uh, two at the beginning, and then I'm going to go through some properties, some examples to really kind of solidify the idea. And then at the end, I'm going to show you my favorite proof. It's really, really neat. So the Pythagorean theorem states that if you are given a right triangle, just like in trigonometry, we're sticking with right triangles for a minute. So if you are given a right triangle, Okay, so a triangle with a right angle in it. And you label the sides of the triangle, the two legs A and B, and the hypotenuse C. It is a true fact that if you take the square with side length A, so, the, so with area A squared, and the square with side length B, so the area b squared, and you add those two quantities together, you add those two areas together, so a squared plus b squared, you arrive at the amount c squared, the area of the square with side length c. So to put it in an equation form, given the sides of a right triangle, legs a and b and hypotenuse c, it is true that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So that's the Pythagorean theorem, based on right triangles. Now, if this is true, what this allows you to do is if you know any two of the sides of a right triangle, you can find out the third, because if you know any two, you just plug them in and then solve for the third, because you would just move either, either, either you don't know C, and you just plug these two numbers in, square them, and then take the square root by canceling the square on both sides, or you simply subtract one of them over and then do the same thing. So if you know both the legs or one leg and one of the and the hypotenuse then you can find the third side if this is true right and so I'm not just going to leave this here this seems like a non obvious thing to say so I'm going to prove it to you the proof starts like this we have to draw a large square larger than I have room for so this is a square and we're going to mark off points a point on each side of the square that is uh, an equal distance from each corner as I go around. You'll see what I mean. I'm going to mark one there. I'm going to mark one there. And my point is, is that this is the same distance as that. Okay, so it's the same distance along the side. This is also the same distance. So this and this and this are all the same distance. And then this distance is the same as well. Right, so all four of those are the same distance. And we're just going to connect those four points and make a smaller square in, whoops, and make a squalor, uh, squalor smear, a smaller square inside of this one. So we're just going to connect those points. And if it's not perfect, just pretend that I drew it perfectly. It looks pretty good, actually. Uh, it's all right. It's not a big deal if it's not perfect. What I want you to recognize is that I could have picked any distance along this side, and I would have just had to go the same distance on either on every side. And you could almost imagine this little square spinning around inside of the bigger square. But, but changing its size so that the corners always touch the edge of the bigger square. So like if it were the same, if, the, if, the, if I picked zero distance and the, and the corners of this square were the same as the corners of that square, it would just be as big as the square. Now if I had picked halfway between, that would be like when the square is smallest, right? Because it has to, it has to squeeze smaller to, f to put all of its four corners on each side. And so I picked a square that's right about in between, so you can really see what I'm saying. Now remember, I said that I cut the same distance on every side which means I can call, if I call this length A, I'm going to write A down here. And I'm just going to not mark off that all of these are the same length. I'm using one notch on every little line segment there to note that they are the same length, right? That means they're congruent. Um, and if cutting off this little bit on every side is the same length, and since this is a square, that means the part that's left over on every side is all the same length, right? So if I call this B, that means this is B as well. And I'm going to do two notches to notate that all of those are congruent to each other, but not congruent to the ones with one notch, right? But look, this, the, this big square 
it, well, it's a square. So all of its angles are 90 degree angles. They are right angles. If you recall the, the theorem from, from high school geometry, all four of these triangles are congruent to each other because of side, angle, side, right? They all have a side length A and a side length B and between them a right angle, which means that they are all congruent, right? By side, angle, side. I'm not going to go over that. I'm just going to assume you know those theorems already, all the different congruency and similarity proofs because we're going to need to be referencing those a lot. So if you don't know them, go look them up. Uh, congruencies of triangles, congruency theorems of triangles. Now, because these are all right triangles, that means these longer lines that connect the, 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 the dashed parts on, on each side create the hypotenuses of all of these right triangles. But since all the right triangles are the same, their hypotenuses must be the same. So if I call this C right here, then this must be C as well, which means this square inside is c squared. The area of it is c squared. You may ask, how the heck does this help prove the Pythagorean theorem? It seems like we've just drawn a more complicated picture. It seems a little silly. How does this help us? Well, the key to this proof is to take the area of this large square with all of these details and the given values a, b, and c, and you have to write the area of this in two distinct independent um, expressions, but because they are both expressions that are the area of this large square, those two expressions will have to be equal to each other. And you will see the math works out very, very nicely. I'm just going to erase the Pythagorean theorem at the top, and we're going we're gonna to finish out the proof. So how can I write the area of this big square? Well, if I look, the side length is a plus b. And so is this side, a plus b. It should be the same because it's a square. So I could write the area of this square as a plus b squared, right? The area of the square is a plus b squared, right? Well, what is a plus b squared? Let's draw, uh, bring our attention to one other square. Uh, if you don't know this, we're just going to quickly cover it. Squaring a binomial, right? So if I have a square that has side lengths a plus b, then I can draw these delineations, right? I can cut it up into these little pieces. And now, if you remember um, middle school biology class when you would do uh, Punnett squares, this is going to be a lot like that. So all we're going to do is we're going to take each thing in the top row and multiply it by each thing in the column once and only once. And we're going to put those in those in those spots. What this is actually equal to is a plus b times a plus b times a plus b. And you've been told that you have to FOIL, which is multiply the first things, the outsides, the insides, and the last ones, which is, say, which is to say multiply everything in here by everything in here. Well, why do that? What you're really doing is this, because a plus b squared is the area of a square that has side lengths a plus b. That's what that number like geometrically means. And so the area of this little piece here is a times a, which is a squared, right? And this thing is a times b. So a times b, and this thing is also a times b, right? We just this is the this is the width of it, and this is the length of it. So it's a times b, a times b, and this is b times b, or b squared. So we know that either through foiling or doing the Punnett square kind of thing, you end up with. Now we just have to add up the pieces because that'll give us the area of the square. We get a squared plus a b plus a b, which is two times a b. So plus two a b plus b squared. So that's the area of both of these squares. This was just to help us figure out this, because that's what you were told it was from foiling, and so I just wanted to give a geometric understanding of that, because this is also a square with side lengths a, a plus b. This is the area of this square. So there's our first representation of the area. Now, this is saying, let's take the area of the square simply by multiplying the sides. Well, if I had a full piece of paper, and then I tore it up into a bunch of pieces. The sum of all of those pieces would give me the same amount of paper as the original full piece of paper. So the trick is to write the area of this square as the sum of its five parts. These four triangles plus this little square in the middle. And if we write it as the sum of those parts, it has to be the same number as whatever this is right? Because it's the area of the same square. So they have to be equal. Whatever we end up with, they have to be equal. So I'm going to erase this because this was just a demonstration for this, and then we'll finish out the proof. Well, we have four congruent triangles. So we really only have to calculate the area of one of them, and then we can just multiply that by four, right? So 
What is the area of a triangle? Well, a triangle is half of a rectangle, right? A, or half of a parallelogram, and the area of a parallelogram is base times height. So the area of a triangle is one half times the base times the height. So we have a base of A and a height of B, and we have to multiply that by one half, right? And that's the area of one triangle. One half AB, right? And then there's four of them, so we just have to multiply that by four. So the area, the first term in the area is just going to be four, times 1 half times a times b. And this is our second representation of the area. So that's the sum of the four triangles. And then what's this? This is c times c. The square in the middle is c squared, right? So we have to add c squared. I know that this expression and this expression have to be equal to each other because they both represent the area of this square. So I'm just going to move down to the bottom of the board, and I'm going to write these more expressively, and I'm going to simplify this. So we have that a squared plus 2 times a times b plus b squared is equal to... Now, what's 4 times 1 half? Well, 4 times 1 half is the same as 4 divided by 2, so 4 times 1 half is 2. So this is just 2 times a b, right? 2 times a b plus c squared. So plus c squared. 2ab is being added to both sides of the equation, which means we can simply subtract it from both sides. And what are we left with? We're left with a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The Pythagorean theorem. It is proven. Okay, so before I show you the second proof of the Pythagorean theorem, I need to explain something that this means now that we know that it's true, first of all. We know that it's true completely. Uh, that, was a, that was a general argument. Um, now I need to explain something that, that is like a corollary of that proof, of that theorem. So I said that uh, if you have a right triangle, then the Pythagorean theorem states that this squared plus this squared equals that squared, right? So what if we did other shapes? What if it didn't have to be a square? What if I did semicircles on every side, the diameters of which are the legs and hypotenuse of the square? Well, if I draw the squares in that we had in the original definition, right? Uh, technically, these would only go halfway up the squares, but the point is, this semicircle is about 39% of this little square, and this semicircle is about 39% of this little square, and this semicircle is about 39% of this big square, which means using the semicircles is just the same as saying about 39% of a squared plus about 39% of b squared is about 39% of c squared, and then you simply cancel that 39% on both sides, and you get back to a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what this actually means is the Pythagorean theorem is true as long as these three shapes on the each of the sides are defined by the lengths of the sides and are all similar. So it doesn't have to be squares, it's just it just so happens that it's easiest to work with squares because working with semicircles gives you the factor of pi and, and one half and it's really annoying. So squares are the simplest, but it can be any set of three similar shapes that are all defined uh, by each of the sides, respectively. So that's an interesting uh, detail there, and so that's going to help us with the second proof of the Pythagorean theorem. So the second proof of the Pythagorean theorem is thanks to everyone's favorite German fellow, Albert Einstein, and he recognized something really, really interesting, and it's based on what I just explained about similar shapes. So I'm going to draw a right triangle, but one that's sitting on its hypotenuse like so. And I'm simply going to draw what's called an altitude from this right angle. An altitude is a, a line segment within a triangle that goes from a vertex perpendicularly towards the opposite side. So I'm just going to drop an altitude like that, right? And that's the proof. QED, the Pythagorean theorem is proven. That you may be thinking, what the heck? That's kind of silly. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, what did I say in the last part? As long as you have three similar shapes, each defined respectively by the side that they're assigned to, then you have a corollary to the Pythagorean theorem. Now, how is that related to this? Well, the big triangle has a right angle in it. It also has this angle here. So the triangle ADB, the little triangle, has a right angle right here. And it also shares this second angle because it's tucked into this part of the big triangle. 
And when two triangles share two angles, they must be similar triangles because the sum of the three angles inside of every triangle is always 180. So if you know two of them for two triangles, then the third angle that they have must also be the same because all three numbers always have to add up to 180. So because they share this angle and a right angle, ABD is similar to ABC. And the hypotenuse of the little triangle is the small leg of the big triangle. So keep that in mind. If we look at triangle BDC, the medium triangle, this is also similar to the big triangle ABC because it also has a right angle, just like ABC, and it is tucked into this angle, which is also an angle of the big triangle. So because B, BDC and ABC share two angles, they are also similar. Since the little triangle and the medium triangle are both similar to the big triangle, they must also be similar to each other, which means all three triangles are similar to each other. This little triangle, its hypotenuse, is the shortest leg of the big triangle. And this medium triangle, its hypotenuse, is the medium leg of the big triangle. And the big triangle, its hypotenuse, is the hypotenuse of the big triangle. Which means we have, if I just take these triangles and flip them on their hypotenuses outside of the triangle, like this, I just flip them to the outside, right? I simply flip them out, right? Reflect them over their own hypotenuses. We end up with three similar shapes that are defined respectively by the legs that add up together, using the triangle itself to, to prove the Pythagorean theorem, right? So you don't actually have to know that the Pythagorean theorem is true first. You can show that if it is true, it must therefore hold for all triplets of similar shapes defined by the sides of the triangle, and then you can use this to prove it, because we're using this small triangle as the leg here, this medium triangle as the shape for this leg here, and the triangle itself as the, as the hypotenuse, using the triangle itself to prove the Pythagorean theorem. It's pretty brilliant. Thank you, Einstein.